Hello, this is a live stream. I am Zach Whalen. I'm the professor of this class. Um, that is to say, this is a live stream from one of my classes, uh, Applied Digital Studies. This is for section two, which meets at 2.50, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I think this will be the last stream for this class, although I might do one during finals week just to talk about some of your projects if you all allow me to. But um, mainly this is probably the last regular day of class and I wanted to do it, well not the rest, regular day of class, but the last um, Twitch stream for class. And, and I, I sent an announcement with this uh, information through Canvas earlier today. I thought it made sense for me to do this through Twitch because I want to talk about video games and that's the thing you can do with Twitch. Um, that's in fact the main thing you're supposed to do with Twitch, I think. Although when I look at the Twitch homepage, it's like people doing all kinds of other stuff with, uh, with Twitch that's not related to video games or it's like playing video games but in a bathtub which I don't I don't approve of um, anyway this is uh, not what I'm going to do um, but for my class I, I put out a, uh, on Friday I sent out like a forum to uh, a survey basically to see what you all wanted me to talk about given that there were basically a couple extra days in the, in the schedule and I uh, the, the most popular thing by far was for me to talk about some weird art and indie and um, political video games and so that's what I'm going to do today. I, I've got several examples full, pulled up, maybe eight or nine, and my intention is, is literally just to, to play through these and talk about these a little bit. Um, in the context of this class, this is a class on digital studies and one of the things that we're interested in with digital studies are the ways in which digital media can communicate and convey ideas and help us think through ideas and explore problems and video games are certainly a digital medium with some pretty important and unique characteristics that let us explore ideas in different ways and I wanted to take a chance to talk about some of these today. So that's what I'm doing today. Um, if you are in the class, uh, then of course, um, I hope you're watching if you're in the class. Uh, if you are not in my class, then you're of course still welcome to watch. I don't, I don't mind. That's why I put it on Twitch. Um, but I have a couple of notes just for people in the class. Uh, one of those is if you haven't yet done this, then please do. This is the big project gallery info. Um, you might want to wait until you're done with your big project. If you're not totally done yet, you can still wait. But please do this as soon as you're done. Uh, I want to have some information about your project. And please do this even if you don't want me to share it, right? Because there is an option down here. You can say, um, uh, here, yeah. So down here, you can, say, you can say no if you would rather I not share it. And that's fine. It's your choice. It's your content. Um, but I want to know either way. So please do that. And please follow the form anyway. And please tell me either way if I'm allowed to share it in. Uh, an archive kind of presentation. So that's that. Um, also, yeah, the, the big project itself is due soon. I think it's Wednesday, actually. Um, but that's just to turn it in in Canvas, just so there's a, a place for you to turn it in. The real final for this class is not the big project itself, but the reflection on the big project, reflection and self-evaluation, and that is due next week, uh, during finals week, I think Wednesday. So um, that's coming up. If you have any questions about that, let me know. But uh, otherwise, I'm going to spend today really just talking about video games, playing a few of them, showing you some things. Uh, and again, this is really just one example of what we mean by digital media, digital in the context of digital studies at UMW. So that's what we're, we're talking about. Um, uh, no, you don't, and that's all Ryan's question, you, you do not have a progress report due today. Um, there were a total of three and the last one was due last week. So you should be done. I mean, I hope you're, you, you might still be working on it. You might still be making progress. I hope you are, but you uh, don't have to turn anything in past those. Uh, okay, so let me get into it a little bit here. Um, I, I just have some notes here for myself. These are not, uh, this is not really a slideshow. Um, this is just to kind of remind me of the things I wanted to talk about and also to remind me to convey this content warning. So uh, I'm gonna be demonstrating some video games in here and there are two things that I want you to know about before I start. Uh, one of these is that some of this work that I'm gonna show you might be offensive. Um, I'm going to be talking about some games that are uh, politically oriented or have an ideological point of view and you may find you disagree with that point of view, the, the, the point of view expressed in these video games. Also the way that some of them uh, are presenting their point of view you could find offensive as well. Um, I, I'm not um, necessarily endorsing every point of view that you see here in some of these video games but um, I do show you games that I feel like have value um, regardless of their point of view uh, but I, I think I probably do actually agree with most of the points of view that I'm going to show you, but the point is that um, you, you know, there, there is, I mean, we're talking about politics here, and so uh, there is a chance that some of you might um, not agree with the point of view you see. That's fine. I hope you understand that that's fine. I hope that that's, uh, you know, a reasonable kind of 
I, discomfort, if that makes sense. Um, but you'll see some of these things, they may be offensive. I will try to give you a heads up. Uh, nothing, nothing super violent, actually, uh, that I'm, well, one of them. One of them is pretty violent, but the others are not. Uh, they're more, actually two of them. Uh, but it's more um, the, the meaning that you might find objectionable, but we'll see. Uh, the other thing is photosensitivity. And if you have any kind of photosensitive issues like epilepsy or things that are triggered by photosensitive things, I will be showing you some games that do have that kind of thing in them. I will give you a heads up as I get ready to start them. Um, but they are coming up sort of in the latter group of things that I want to show you today. So those are the two heads ups, heads, head ups, heads ups. Those are the two things that you should know before I proceed. Okay, so here's a term. I just wanted to put this out here because this is a term that kind of underpins some of the things I want to show you in the first part here. Procedural rhetoric. And this is uh, the, actually I just thought of something. Sorry, I just, I just thought of something I wanted to add here. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to that again. But um, procedural rhetoric is a term that I wanted to give you because it's a term that uh, helps explain what's unique about what we're looking at. And there's a whole bunch I could go into about this. This is a, a topic that we cover in my games and culture class, which I'll be teaching in the fall. Um, so I, I'm not going to do that whole lecture or that whole like set of things really, but just to give you a little bit of uh, a background on this. Uh, the basic idea is that if we look at video games as rhetorical objects, in other words, things that present ideas about culture and life and humanity and, and explain things basically, uh, in other words, they are rhetorical objects. Uh, procedural rhetoric is a way to, like talking about a game's procedural rhetoric is a way to talk about the things that are unique about it as a video game. Um, so at UNW, we offer a class called visual rhetoric. Uh, we certainly uh, look at verbal rhetoric or, or oral rhetoric when we look at um, speaking intensive classes, right? Like this is an aspect of communication. But uh, video games can include those things. They can include text, they can include graphics, um, and they can employ visual rhetorical elements or uh, verbally rhetorical elements. Uh, but the thing that they can do that other media cannot do is use processes to make arguments. And so this is a term, procedural rhetoric. It's coined by Ian Bogost. Um, and you know, there's, you know, there's a whole set of discussions around these things. There's this whole sort of critique of this point of view called that um, recognizes it as a kind of proceduralism and, and like says that maybe we're overemphasizing it. There's a whole set of things around this that I don't want to get into, but I just wanted to point out that uh, when we're talking about video games making arguments or getting ideas across, usually we're interested in the ways that they use process. And process is um, probably easiest to see if you think about like a simulation game where you try different things and you see what happens as a result. But every kind of game that I'm going to play here today, some of these are action oriented, um, some of them don't have goals, but there's always something that I'm doing that the game responds to in some way. So there's always a process, there's always some code running, there's some kind of algorithm that creating what I experience. And in these involvements, uh, we're talking about process. And we could be talking about rhetoric as well. So this is a term that I think is generally applicable, applicable to a lot of video games. Probably all video games in some way could be said to have some sort of rhetorical element to them if there's any kind of meaning happening. Um, but this is just a term, since, oh, since this is a lecture, you know, might as well teach you something. Um, the other thing though is I want to show you something. So let me do that. So like I said, some of these games are gonna be, you know, you might find offensive. So I, I'm not trying to offend people. I'm not, that's not my intention. I just want to, uh, you know, show you some things. So let's see here. The first few I'm going to put in, uh, they're, they're web-based, so they should be pretty easy to pull up and kind of get right into it with one of these that I think is probably the most rhetorically effective and yet also one of the most, um, I don't know if offensive is the right word, but it, it could be disturbing. So let me explain it before I play it. So this is a game called Thoughts and Prayers, the game. Um, and it is a game about mass shootings. Uh, it is not a game where you play as a mass shooter. Uh, you are playing someone who is responding to and trying to do something about mass shootings. Uh, the fact that the game is called Thoughts and Prayers uh, might give you a hint about what's going on. Um, I will play it so you can see, but here it says, see if you can stop mass shootings with every politician's favorite tools, thoughts and prayers. Think and pray as fast as you can and see if you can end the bloodshed. Um, and so as the game starts, it's going to show several, uh, the map looks like this. It's not going to depict shooting or violence, but it will have several like hashtags and uh, essentially um, fatality counts for different mass shootings. Um, there have been a lot of mass shootings in the United States in the past couple of weeks. So um, I recognize that and, it, and it's a painful and disturbing thing to know about. Uh, so I don't, I'm going to show you the game anyway. 
Um, I think it's a commentary and a response to mass shootings, but it's a painful kind of response. So uh, let me show you what I mean. This is a, an example of, uh, as I said, procedural rhetoric in the context of an ideological or a, a game with a point of view. So let's take a look. So thoughts and prayers, the game. And this is by a group called Everyday Arcade. Um, I don't know much about them other than these games that they produce on everydayarcade.com. America faces an epidemic of mass shootings. It's up to you to stop them with the power of your thoughts and prayers. Let us pray. So I have two controls, T and P, I can hit. I can also tap the buttons like, like this, but I can just hit the keys to go faster. So pray for Augustus, 23 killed. Pray for Billings, 13 killed. All right, here's another one, ban assault weapons. Oh, you depend on the NRA donations, so I can't do that. Can I, that's an American. You depend on NRA donations. Pray harder. Praying as fast as I can. Think more. Pray harder. It says, great job. Thoughts and prayers, 60. Live save, zero. All right, let's try again. Think and pray. I'm going to hit the B button to try to ban assault weapons. I don't know if you can hear, but it's making little sound effects. I can't hear much over the my keyboard. Uh, almost done. You depend on NRA donations. Okay, so great job. 91 thoughts and prayers that time. Uh, zero live suit. Um, this is an example of what you might call uh, rhetoric of failure uh, because it is not possible to succeed in this game no matter how much you think and how much you pray. And this is a kind of procedural rhetoric because it illustrates or it's meant to um, highlight the futility of a, of a process. Uh, this is a process that's modeled in the game that's meant to uh, mimic a process in the real world, um, although what the, the, the point of it is is that the process is actually not a process. Um, when we encounter a tragedy in the world, a common response to here is thoughts and prayers. Our thoughts and prayers are with the people of whatever. Uh, and this is, uh, the game is saying, uh, an empty kind of response because it does not actually change anything about the situation that led to the mass shooting. And the only thing that would seem to be a solution in this game that you see here is the banning of assault weapons, but you can't do it. Um, it's, showing us, it's showing you that option, but not letting you choose that option. And that's another kind of uh, rhetorical moment there. As a persuasive element, the argument seems to be that maybe we could try that in the real world, uh, but we can't because of political reasons, because of uh, the NRA, for example. So this is um, something we haven't tried. We can't try in the game, and we haven't tried in the real world. But in the game, mass shootings continue. In the real world, mass shootings continue. Uh, so maybe we should do something about it. Maybe we should actually try banning assault weapons and see if that makes a difference. Uh, so these are, th there is an argument to this, right? Um, some other ones, let's take a look at, let's see, uh, let's, I also really like Bomb the Right Place. Um, it's, it's also, the, the message is a little different. Um, the world thinks America is weak. As commander in chief, it's up to you to prove them wrong. By bombing. Uh, this is a game, if it's critiquing something, it's really critiquing um, international foreign, like foreign policy. And you might say that it's sort of anti-interventionist in its message, as you'll see here. But the point is to try to, you know, we did, our satellites have detected enemy ground movement just outside of Kabul. Okay, well, let's look at some democratic options. Or di let's look at diplomatic options first. Um, no. You made America look weak. If we don't answer our enemies with force, they'll walk all over us. Okay, so let's try again. Another sort of rhetoric of failure thing. A peaceful solution is not available, so we have to choose the bomb solution. Let's bomb Kabul. Okay, where is Kabul? Um, oh, I forgot to click in time. Okay. Well, I made America look weak. Let's try again. Bomb Kabul. I think that's. Oh, man! <laughs> That was close. Oh, I bombed Iran. That's, and it, but it always says uh, close one. You are only 620 miles from Kabul. I think they still got the message. Time to continue. So what's being really highlighted here is my lack of uh, geographic knowledge. Bomb Cairo. Okay. 
Okay, so I actually know this one. Direct ish hit? Wow, only 64 miles from Cairo. Tap to keep bombing. So the only action available here is bombing, right? And so I think this is another critique of foreign policy. If bombing is your only option, you're going to keep doing it. Um, I think it said Baghdad, right? Pretty close. Direct ish hit. Alright, let's see. So it's actually, you know, it's actually sort of educational. Kandahar. Oh man. Um, no, that's wrong. It was over there. Uh, close one. You were only 342 miles. I panicked. I thought that was to Afghanistan. Okay. Uh, you see the challenge. Um, bomb Pyongyang. Oh boy. Okay. Sure. Pretty close. Yeah. So this is kind of it's a geography quiz. Geography. Oh, yes. uh, oh man, it's way off. <laughs> Alright, so you see the point. People often have very strong opinions about specific places around the world, um, but uh, I think the critique here is that often we don't actually know much about the geography of those places. Uh, the suggestion is that perhaps we shouldn't be bombing these places if we don't even know that much about them. Um, and that, I think that's I, I think that's a message I agree with. I don't know about you. Um, okay, so let's look at some more. Um, Unmanned is pretty good, but kind of takes a while to develop what the point is. Uh, so I think I'm not going to play that right now. Um, but the best amendment, this one's kind of, I don't know if I can explain it in time. I, I sort of didn't do a great job in the previous section because I sort of ran out of time, but I want to try it. Um, so this is a game called, I'm going to have to switch some things up here, but this is a game called The Best Amendment, and it is about the Second Amendment, um, but it is meant to be tongue-in-cheek. It's a work of satire. It's by Molly Industria, uh, the, the political game group. So let me see if I can figure out how to switch to the right scene here. And let me see if I can play it. This game is, it uses an unusual game mechanic, so it's a little tricky for me to play and talk about it at the same time. Um, so I'm gonna do my best. Okay, okay so you're trying to collect the stars. As you see, I'm playing in a figure with a, a white. I'm playing a figure with a white hood, um, and I can control a gun. I'm moving this arrow keys around, right? So the rhetoric here is to critique the idea of um, the sort of good guy with a gun defense of um, you know the Second Amendment. So, so what's unique about this game is that you play against your past self. So it's kind of hard to see as you, unless you're actually controlling it. With these two, the black hooded figures now, these are the last two levels as I played them. So I'm controlling the white one and the black two are the things I just did. So in order for me to get the stars, I have to shoot my past self or get them first. Um, so it's a really clever game mechanic. Um, you've got to, it's a challenge. Like you, it's, it's interesting and challenging. Um, but you end up having to fight against your your, your past self. And it's pretty hard. Um, also, like, kind of fun, um, even though it's really, as you see, the imagery is violent and the, uh, the, the imagery, the, the, the KKK imagery is also obviously disturbing. So anyway, I'm, yeah, I'm struggling with that game, so I'm going to, um, Go ahead and end it, but um, hopefully get the point. It's it's using this game mechanic of uh, forcing you to play against yourself. It's a multiplayer game basically, but you're playing against past versions of yourself, um, and, and in that you are critiquing the idea of a good guy with a gun defense. Uh, I think the the critique is that um, the the argument that uh, that we that good guys with guns and are really like we need good guys with guns because there are bad guys with guns. Uh, the critique of that is that like you're you, who's to say what you are until you use it and if you use it in a, in a bad way to hurt somebody um it's too late right it's too late to stop that from happening if it turns out oh you were actually were a bad guy all along it's like we don't we aren't inherently good guys or bad guys we just are in situations and in different situations who knows what any individual is going to do so maybe we should just not have guns right that seems like a pretty reasonable um 
solution, although I'm, it's obviously not that simple, but you see the, hopefully the point that this lets us think about uh, these kind of issues. Okay, so let me see if I can figure out how to play a couple more. Um, let me see. So those are a couple of political games. I mean, there's, there's quite a few more. Um, I'll show you a couple of places you can find some more if you're interested in this kind of thing. Um, right there. So uh, uh, Everyday Arcade, th there's several there that are really good. So, uh, some of them are just a little bit convoluted, I feel like, or, or maybe they try too hard or they're too much on the nose with their, their point they're making. Um, so they're good. Molly Industria is a website uh, of, that produces that, that game, the, the Best Amendment, but quite a few others. Um, that are pretty good. Some of them are very strident in their points. Some are, are more abstract and just, you know, really experimenting with different uh, kinds of things. Oh yeah, booing at the Confederate flag. Like it literally is just you boo at the flag. Um, so uh, it, it, that's all it is. That's all it needs to be. But yeah, they definitely have a particular point of view. It's definitely a progressive um, point of view and it's, you know, it's interesting. Um, another one I wanted to play, I think is just a web browser game. Yeah, so I'm going to play this one. This is another game with a point of view. Um, it is political, I suppose, but it's really more about um, like personal, a personal experience. So uh, it's called Hair Not. Nah. It's a travel game about a black woman is, who is tired of people touching her hair. So as a, I am a naughty black woman, I'm a white man, and I don't deal with this problem. I don't deal with people trying to touch my hair. But the point of this game is created by someone who experiences this, someone named Momo, Momo Pixel, who I, that, that I feel like is a screen name. But Momo Pixel is trying to point out that this is an experience that many black women do have, and it's really creepy and invasive. It, uh, people invade their personal space frequently, and we get to experience that um, by playing this game that kind of plays with that idea and makes it kind of a fun game. Um, but it's still really illustrating a pretty disturbing problem that women uh, experience. So uh, we are, Ava loves to travel, but is hesitant because people often invade her personal space by touching her hair without permission. So help Ava catch her flight and protect her hair by stopping the reaching hands. Okay, so we pick a skin tone, we pick a hairstyle, um, and th these things don't matter. Like it, it's the same game, <laughs> whatever your hairstyle and whatever your skin tone. And the na meter is what we're keeping track of as it goes up. Um, I use the arrow keys left and right to swat hands away as they, they come across. So let me see how I do. Um, the challenge is that, well, there's two challenges. First of all, you have to time it to actually hit them before they touch you. First level is pretty easy. Um, but um, you can't just spam slaps. Uh, the, the, the meter will go down if you do that. And I think there's a, rhet a rhetorical point to that too. Um, first of all, you do have to defend your space. I'll show you what happens if you Is don't. It, to your head? it just sort of turns red, you know. But, you know, so you lose points, basically, or you lose your, your meter. Ooh. But you also lose the meter if you just spam. Like, if you just so, yeah. go like that, it goes down pretty fast, too. I think the point of that, or the what that gets across, is the idea that um, yeah, you, know, you can't be just super defensive all the time, or else people aren't, you know, you're going to have right. other problems in getting around, and you're going to make people angry. Is it catch to your head? Yeah, okay, this one's getting really hard, because <laughs> I was trying to, uh, there we go, I just barely made it. <laughs> this game is hard. Uh, oh, says you did that next. Alright, so now we got to go through the TSA checkpoint. Ooh. That was hard. Okay, <laughs> I made it. Uh, but that was challenging. Now we're on the plane. Ooh. So See the creeper in the back, by the way? It just popped up. It pops up and down. I can't point to it, but it's, it's up there. Man, I'm struggling. Is it attached to your head? When the hands come that fast, you can pretty much just spam it. Alright, so I made it to Havana. Great. I won. But as it says, the game is over, but this experience isn't. Uh, this is an issue that black women face. 
place daily. Um, so this is, it's, it's an educational game. I mean, it's meant to get a point of view across. Um, and this is saying to people who do it, stop that shit, as it says. All right, so, Hair Nah uh, by Momo Pixel. I mean, honestly, a pretty fun game to play, but it illustrates something I, that's kind of disturbing in a way. Like, I, it's something that I don't experience, so to think of it, um, you know, it's, uh, it's important to know that, about it, but it's uh, unfortunate that it exists. Okay, so I'm going to show you another game here. This is shifting more into kind of art kind of games. Uh, this is a game called Game, 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 and Again Game by Jason Nelson. Um, and it is a flash game, but it does not, it, it is somewhat preserved in this view that I have here, but it is not perfect. It doesn't completely work. Um, one of the things that's missing is uh, animations and videos that pop up in the, real, in the original version. Uh, they don't work in this version. Um, but you get the basic idea of it. So this is playable as a game, and as you can see, it's a platformer. I'm moving left and right. You can hear the sound, hopefully. Um, trying to avoid blue things, trying to touch red things. Um, there's quite a bit of text here. Below this icy spring are animals, the senatorial spring has parole, as population, not human. In the forensic way, things for rooms saying you are between 50 and 90% of victims and more than half dissipate. Um, this is, I think you could say, a work of digital poetry, Book of Gregory. And forth came the numbers, all super powerful, and teaching hidden hours to batteryless clocks. Um, the, this part, the click here, this part doesn't. That's the part that doesn't work. Oh, I can hear the audio for it, actually. Cool, but you can't see the imagery for it. It's usually like, a, it's like a home movie. Um, and so this is a game all about sort of Baroque excess and sort of overwhelming visuals. Um, but it is also playable. Um, but the sense in which it's playable is kind of, it's kind of hard to explain because the, the point of it, I think, is that it's not actually as hard as it looks or the overly, the, the message, the surface level message is, uh, that's conveyed through the procedural logic of it is actually um, deceptively uh, naive. Like it's, the, like it's, it's actually meant to be sort of sophomoric. This, this one in particular, like the, the lesson of it, this is the level about capitalism. So of course it's about climbing a, a staircase and then falling out at the end. Uh, it's a little bit too obvious. And I think that's, um, I'm not critiquing Jason Nelson's work here. I'm saying that I think that's what he wants us to notice about this. So this is actually um, kind of an act as well. Like he's kind of playing a, a, a certain type of game designer in making this, if that makes sense. It's kind of hard to get into that detail, but uh, yeah, working my way through it. Oops. Um, let me get to the end. Because there's one level I'm curious to see if it'll work at all on this computer. Um, so, and that's going to drop me. Oh, there. Okay. So, i got to watch out for those blue scribbly guys. Oh, no. Come on, okay. Drop through here. Come on and oh. meet your maker. Come on and meet your maker. Come on and meet your maker. Come on and meet your maker. Oh, okay, I give up. <laughs> I'll play this later. It's a fun game though. Um, but definitely a game where like the visuals are more interesting probably than the gameplay. Um, he has a whole series of these games, and I think they're you could view them as a series. So starting with game, 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 and again, game, uh, followed by. Uh, I made it. Well, wait, I forget the exact sequence, but I made this. You played this. We are enemies. Uh, alarmingly, these are not lovesick zombies and evidence of everything exploding. I think those four games really hang together as an idea uh, for, by, by Jason Nelson, who is a digital poet and artist um, who does things like this. I mean, these are, I think, pretty characteristic of his style. It's kind of kind of glitchy, kind of messy, um, but very engaging and very like friendly and, and at the same time. Uh, and I really like that aspect of it. Okay, so I want to take a look at a few others, and I got this one is a web one, so I'm going to show it to you, and then I have a few more that are not web-based. So Ian McClarty, I don't know Ian McClarty other than uh, I found his work online. I think it's really interesting. Um, this is a game called If We Were Allowed to Visit, and it is actually kind of a digital poem. It's kind of hard to look at, but it is legible. Like these are, you can see the words here, and it's a, a digital poem that I can move around in uh, as a video game. So I'm going to use uh, my arrows and... So I'm moving, I'm moving the mouse left and right, and it's kind of hard to tell, but this first, like there's a, a rectangle here showing me the directions, and I can move, oh, I have to use arrow keys, or no, not letting me move. Oh, no. Let me 
think I need to get in focus again. There we go. So now I can move forward. There's a house here and I can move toward it. The house is made out of poetry. Oh, something just, I don't know what that is. Something just walked by. Um, so, or maybe there's a tumbleweed. Can't quite see it. Yeah, tumble. Um, and so there's, you can see the text that makes up the roof. On the side, it says vinyl cladding. This is a house, you can walk into it. There's a, a, a yellow, brown, black carpet in the middle of the room, and I can look around, uh, cream, vintage cream cladding, and looking at the walls. So it's a game, it's a, but it's really more of a three-dimensional navigable poem that includes elements based on what's around. If you look up, you can see, I think these are like air molecules. I think that's the idea. Um, and then you can look down and you can look at dust, clay, dirt, ground, and so on. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting work. It's kind of hard to, to make sense of visually. And you kind of have this, your eyes kind of switch back and forth between reading the text and then trying to see this, like this is eucalyptus tree. So it's like you can see it as all of these words that make up this concrete poem, or you could also look at it as like, like a tree. And so it's like, it's hard to see both at the same time and your eye kind of goes back and forth between those two. And it's really um, can be kind of challenging after a while. So yeah, um, this is, uh, this is, this is this work here. Um, and yeah, Amelia, I saw your question. I'll, I'll send that later. Um, but I will, you can uh, remind me later if I forget, but I, I can send that to you after I'm done with this. Um, okay, so that's if we were allowed to visit by Ian McClarty. Um, so then, uh, let me show you some more. So these are some works that are gonna get kind of glitchy and kind of hard to look at. Uh, Catacombs of Solaris is a visually, I think, pretty challenging work, um, but I really like it a lot, but it, I like it in, a, in an unusual way. Uh, unusual way. Like it, um, it kind of hurts my eyes, but I kind of like that. I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I do kind of like it. So just let me find it. I'm. Continue to be really disappointed with the way that it, uh, Windows hides things, but uh, here's that. And take me a minute. I might need to do some adjusting to get it to show up correctly in OBS. Let's take me a couple of tries here. Usually, yeah, there it is. Okay, that looks pretty good. Yeah, that's it's missed it's messed up a little bit, but you can kind of see it. So um, this is a game that's very difficult visually to look at. So uh, this might be the photo. It, you know, if anyone with photosensitivity, this might be something like that. Um, it's not going to flash on me, but it's going to the way that movement works is going to be pretty disorienting. So as you can see, I'm hopefully you can see it. it's like I'm in a maze and there are walls all around and um, Straight ahead, there seems to be a hallway. It looks like there's a passageway off to the left and one off to the right, and maybe another one off to the right down at the end of the hallway. However, if I go forward, typing the W key, uh, that is no longer a hallway, now it is a corner, and now I've crashed into this corner. Um, so I can look to the left and right, and just sort of walking in any direction, and basically, uh, now I'm at the a T intersection. I've got, it looks like a passageway left and right, except I don't anymore, um, and it, it seems to go better if you move more quickly. Like if you move consistently through it, things seem to stay a little bit more stable. But if you pause, uh, things reset. So like here's a straightforward, it looks like I'm looking at a wall, but I've paused and now if I go forward, it's not a wall anymore, it's a hallway down this direction into the wall. Um, so it's like, let me pause here. And now that used to be a hallway to the left, but not anymore. So basically, if you, as long as you keep moving, it sort of makes sense, but if you pause, things start to get kind of weird. And uh, yeah, so you can almost control it. Like you can almost decide what you want to look at and you can simplify it essentially by kind of pausing to focus. So here I've looked into a purple thing and so I'm sort of moving through space, but you can't tell because I'm in, I'm like locked into this purple void. Um, and I don't know if I can get out of it actually. So maybe this is how you win the game, I don't know. Um, it's a pretty interesting work, but pretty visually challenging. That's also by Ian McClarty, who did that work I just showed you all. There's no sound, by the way. I don't know, you couldn't hear anything, but there was, there was no sound to hear. Okay, so another one that I find really interesting, but uh, visually challenging, is a work called Memory of a Broken Dimension. These are all free, by the way, these games I'm showing you, so um, I encourage you to check these out if you are interested in video games. Uh, this is uh, some Memory of a Broken Dimension. It's by, put some names here in case you want to Google it later. XRA is the developer. 
Um, this is a demo of it, or a, um, a prototype, I guess, or maybe maybe use the term beta. The point is, it's not um, complete as a game. It's something that's been sort of in progress for several years now. I want to say like five or six, maybe seven years. Um, and every now and then there's an, an update, but it's usually just like it's still still a work in progress. Um, it's a really interesting and, and visually challenging game. Again, it's a little bit flashy and glitchy, um, but it's more it's more glitchy than more glitchy than flashy, if that makes sense. So let me see. Let me, I've got to get OBS to pick it up. Sometimes it takes a second. And yeah, there we go. I want to make that bigger. So, okay. So it starts off with, with this view that looks like a, uh, a file system on an operating, or not, like an operating system, like a command line. Uh, it says this is the Relics OS. And you can do some things like you can normally do in a command line. Like you can type, um, I just noticed it's got an IP address there. I don't know if that's, I mean, it's a local IP address, so hopefully that's, I don't know if that's real. I don't know. Anyway, so you can type like DIR to look at the list of commands, um, look at your list of uh, files and folders in the current directory that you're in. Um, and so using this space will make a little bit more sense if you've used a Windows command line before, but if not, like there's certain things that you, you could just try. So you've got void scan.exe, remote.exe. Um, the, the text changes and glitches. Um, your goal in this level, this part of it, is to try to dive. So if you hit dive, it says no second dot find found void scan ready? Question mark. So I don't know. Maybe we should try the void scan. It says uh, void scan doesn't work. Check remote.exe. Okay, great. So let's check remote. And um, so there's kind of a like a little hint system built into this part of it. But this is really just a pregame. This is just like the prologue, basically. But, uh, but uh, what we're doing essentially is trying to connect to this other dimension via this this satellite portal which as you can see is somewhat unstable. So it's doing its connection thing. I think it's already connected. So, okay, so we did the remote scan. So let's do, let's scan for voids. And now the sector graph is updating. And we're gonna be visiting these sectors in a moment. Uh, to do that, we are going to need to dive. So let's dive in. So this is a game that's very dark visually, so I need to close my curtain so I can actually see it. All right, so it's a first-person game. I'm moving around. You can see me moving my point of view with the mouse here as I sweep around left and right. And this game, it's hard to see, but there's a little sort of rectangle with a line coming out of it, and it's almost like a reticule. And if you line it up just right, part of the world that's like glitchy, so see this sort of ramp-looking thing? I can walk through it. It's not solid. It's, it's, it's incorporeal, but... If I look at it at the right angle through this thing, it lights up briefly. And if, while it's lit up like that, if I click, it locks it into place. And now it's a solid object, and I can walk up it. And that's my goal in this opening sector. I'm trying to walk up this sort of weird stone ramp looking thingy and jump into this glitchy looking thingy. So I'm in the next room. And that's really what you're doing. You're trying to move from room to room. And in each room, there's a puzzle to solve that has to do with activating these physical structures. And sometimes you have to activate a structure, like in this case, um, off in the corner. And I'm trying to get to that thing at the top of that. It's a pillar, and I'm trying to get to the top of it. But you can't get to the top of it from this room. You have to come from another room. And so you have to go through the walls in order to get to those. Um, so that's not that wall. Yeah, here we go. So here I'm in the next room, and there's these, there's several of these spaces here, things that I can make solid. If I line it up just right, it's just really hard to see. Ah, can't really seem to get this one. There it is. Okay, so it's like a passage, like a catwalk sort of thing up there. Okay, so there's another one over here, I think. And here's th there's also you can use sound to kind of tell you if you're near something, and, and it, it's kind of hard for me to hear with just the one earphone in. Um, but this is a game that you definitely call, I think, experimental. I think the mechanic is actually not as hard as, uh, not that unusual. It's it's a clever mechanic, but what's striking about the game obviously isn't really the mechanic. It's the um, 
the visual and audio effects, which have this glitch art look to it, uh, which is, I don't know how this is accomplished in, in programming, but the effect is very striking. <laughs> I'll say it that way. Uh, I really like it a lot. Kind of makes my teeth hurt in a good way, if that makes sense. So I heard the sound that I was near a thing, but I cannot seem to see it. seem to activate it. It's also, the, the glitch effects are generated dynamically, so it looks different each time you play it. A little bit. There it is. Why can't I get that? It's way up there. I guess I already got it. Okay, well. Whew, okay, Memory of a Broken Dimension by XRA. Pretty intense. Um, I really like this, by the way. So if you, if you, I hit escape to get back to the command line, and um, I, I like this. If you hit escape again, it's like no escape. <laughs> I think it's delightfully ominous. All right, so I think the only way out of this, you got to actually just kill it, like uh, I, like shut down the process. So that was Memory of a Broken Dimension by XRA. I think uh, just a fascinating game and really just nice and, I don't know, chewy. Like it has a real texture to it, which I really find uh, engaging and challenging. Okay, one more example, I think, and this is a game that is an example of what the authors of it call metagaming, and metagaming for Patrick Lemieux and um, Stephanie Bollock, who are the creators of this game that I'm about to show you, if I can find the right folder, is uh, any time whenever you're using, uh, well, their argument is that video games are always doing this, but they, they've created several games that they think uh, especially illustrate the fact that uh, the game isn't the software, the game is the thing you do with the software, and uh, that's what they call uh, metagaming. So I'll show it to you here. But basically the idea is, in this case, they've got, it takes me a minute to get it to work here, but oh yeah, that's, that works. Um, this is 99 exercises in play. And what they're doing in this game is iterating through or permutating through different uh, examples of uh, Super Mario Brothers. So you might recognize this first level of Super Mario Brothers. It is slightly different if you are looking closely. I mean, you can see that I'm leaving some dots behind. There's no time, there's no coins, there's no enemies. You can't go down any pipes, but basically the, the, the structure of this, the topography of this should look familiar to you if you've ever played this game or watched anyone play it. All right, it is basically the same. Try not to fall in the holes, trying to get to the end and lower the flag. Uh, but what they do here is they, they're iterating through um, it's actually not 99 <laughs> different versions of it, it's uh, 30, but the title is a reference to a work called Ray a work by a French writer named Raymond Cano, who wrote a work called 99 Exercises in Style, in which he tells a story 99 different ways, changing different facts about it, writing it in different genres, uh, 99 different ways. Um, and different people have experimented with different versions of 99 something in different media, and so this is Patrick and Stephanie uh, creating this work, oh, I just barely made it, um, <laughs> to il illustrate different ways to change the basic topography and gameplay of this, you know, deceptively simple and super familiar and really cliche uh, example of platform gaming. Um, and each one, each level of this game offers a different transformation. Um, so, as you can see so far, I've just changed my orientation. Um, this is the 270 degree rotation, but still fairly playable. I mean, I can just, I kind of have to tilt my head a little bit, but it's really just about timing, and it's actually the same timing as whatever the orientation is. So you almost don't even need to be able to see it. Barely made that jump. Um, you don't be able, you don't need to be able to see it in the familiar view. Um, and you know, as a, a comment or as a kind of meta game, it is. I think it's asking us to consider why do we always take for granted that we move left to right? I mean, that's something that we automatically do pretty much but there's no inherent reason for that there's no reason that has to be the case and you know why not this right why not move from right to left upside down um, it might change some things it might not it might be easier it might be harder um, but that, it's a different game I mean it's, it's the same controls the same topography but all we've changed is how we're looking at it and the experience I can tell you because I'm playing it right now is pretty different um, it's um, it's harder than it looks. Um, even though you 
think it's pretty much the same. All right, so this one is dynamically tilting, so the faster I go, the more it tilts. So you'll see as I can keep up some pace, as if I can keep up the pace, it'll stay sort of tilted like that, but as I slow down to time some things, it does flip back to normal. Not too bad as long as you're moving consistently, but if you hesitate or stop like this, it does flip, and that flip can be a little disorienting as it goes through it. Uh, a little bit of motion sickness, maybe. Yeah. Oh, there we go. This isn't as bad as the Catacombs of Solaris one. That one, that's the one that messes with me. I like it a lot as an art game, but I don't know if I always like playing it, if that makes sense. So this one, I'm zoomed way out, so my Mario guy is super, super small. I can still see him, but uh, I think actually this one's really easy because you can see the whole thing and you can see what's coming next. You don't have to remember uh, the level. Really, you just have to kind of, oh no. Of course, as I say, it's easy. This one's easier. This is the one I fail at the first time. Um, so you can also see I'm leaving the dots behind as I run through this and that's uh, a, a way to kind of compare and remember these different playthroughs. Uh, the playthrough is really the, the content of the game, not the graphics or the controls. And so those dots are kind of highlighting that. They're kind of reminding us of the fact that it's what we do with this game that makes it what it is. All right, this one's orthographically squished. Same level, same topography, it's just my view of it is compressed so that all of it fits into the screen. It's the same height as it was originally, but it's a lot less wide. And the result is that Mario ends up quite squished. So this is um, a couple of comments. So this being metagaming, you know, there's there's other kinds of metagaming, and this is uh, something that the Patrick and Patrick Lemieux and Stephanie Bollock are arguing in a book they wrote called Metagaming, and they created this to kind of you know to make a point or to to expand our ideas of, of Super Mario Brothers. But they also have, another point about it is to talk about how there is already a lot of metagaming around this particular level um, or this game. Right, so you you might be familiar with speed running and uh, Super Mario speed running is kind of it's very popular. I mean, I don't know. There's probably others that are more popular, but the, it's the kind I usually watch. Um, there was a world record set pretty recently, uh, four minutes fifty four seconds. Uh, so there's 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 different kinds of there are different kinds of speed runs. Right, there's the tool assisted speed run, which uses software uh, to kind of retract any kind of bad move, and then there's uh, just there's the any percent. So it, it, these are different ways that people have created, have used Super Mario Brothers to make different games. So speed running Super Mario Brothers is a kind of metagaming Super Mario Brothers. All right, so this one you actually, you can use V to jump ahead. This one's zoomed in, and this one is definitely challenging because you cannot see where you're going. And so you kind of have to remember the level. You can kind of follow the dots, but they're still, they're also pretty close. But yeah, those come up too fast. I can't hit it in time. Okay, let's move on. So this one's orthographically smushed, so it's vertically smushed this direction. Um, this one is dynamically smushed, so the faster you go, the smushier it gets. Um, this one is slow motion, but it still works. Um, this one is very slow motion, but again, it still works. How slow it goes. And you, uh, you probably can't hear it because the audio is so slow that it's very, very low in pitch, and so it's not actually coming through very much at all. This one's fast motion. This one's really hard because you have to really time the jumps right. Ah, before you fall straight in the holes. It's quite comical, I think, how, how rapidly you fall into the holes. Yeah, okay. Next level is very fast motion, so it's even faster. <laughs> ah. Ah, man, come on. Okay, thank you. Okay, next one is Zeno. This one is a reference to Zeno's paradox, the ancient Greek philosopher. The farther to the right you go, the slower it gets. 
and I have not made it to the end of this one. And in fact, it might be impossible to get to the end of this one. Uh, that would be consistent with Zeno's paradox. Um, but I don't know because I've never, I've never had the patience to try. Um, this one, uh, Mario's Invisible, um, but certainly playable, certainly a coherent experience of this game. Just uh, kind of challenging because it's kind of hard to tell where you are in relation to the holes and the other things you need to jump over and around. Yeah, I fell in a hole. Okay, this one, the level is invisible. So here are the jump lines. I mean, the, the dots that you've been leaving behind in all your previous playthroughs actually come in, come in handy. Um, but this one is definitely, definitely playable. Oh no, okay, I saw that was gonna happen. Uh, this one is called Don't Slow Down, because if you do slow down, you die. So I just, I got too slow there. Uh, this one, you are not allowed to touch the ground. So there's no ground. I don't know if this one's even possible. This this sort of reminds me of um, like in Super Mario Maker on the Wii, you can, or probably, it's probably I have, they probably have that for Switch too, I guess. Um, Sometimes you will find levels that seem impossible, but are technically possible. So it's, uh, this might be one of those. Anyway, so the, the last few really play with distorting your perspective. This one, everything is kind of curled in on itself. Here's all kind of balled up around this center, but certainly still playable. It's almost like you're playing on the surface of a ball. Uh, this one, everything is sort of mangled and torn up. Um, these are definitely playable. Right, and it's still the same topography, um, but you experience it really differently through these different uh, 3D distortions. All uh, right, and then, yeah, it's all mushed up in the middle there. This one I think is actually pretty nice. This is rolling along, and you can, you can kind of see yourself jumping through here. You get up some nice momentum. It's kind of a, kind of a pleasing effect, I think. Anyway, uh, and then this one's a Mobius strip, uh, and then this one is two at once. And this is a real challenge here because they both jump at the same time, or whatever controls you apply, they do, it applies to both. So you have to really watch for the holes uh, because they will experience the holes differently <laughs> with respect to their place in the topography. So this one's a challenge, but I think I just about got it. past all the holes anyway. So yeah, you can see them both. Oh, I didn't realize that. That's cool. You can see them both at the same time. So yeah, definitely a metagame. Now you can do four at once. Same deal. So you gotta watch the holes. If any one of them falls in a hole, it's game over. You can do eight at a time. You can do 16 at a time. Um, it's, I assume, technically possible, but extremely challenging. I didn't even see which one fell in a hole, but one of them fell in a hole. Anyway, so that's uh, metagaming. Um, I mean, this is a game called 99 Exercises, in, 99 Exercises in Play, and it is an example of a metagame by, uh, or an example of metagaming, uh, which is by Patrick Lemieux, Stephanie Bollock. Uh, okay, so that's about it for class today. I do need to go, uh, I don't know for time anyway, but I need to wrap things up. Uh, let's see if anybody's doing still watching yeah i got five viewers all right that's not bad out of a class of 13. um anyway let's uh let me uh, actually I, I shouldn't say it that way uh some people might be watching on youtube and i don't have a way to track those numbers um so amelia wanted to see the google form again with the gallery submission so i'll share that here and um then i'll wrap things up uh wednesday's class will be a uh, uh zoom and we will that will be our last uh, regularly scheduled class, although hopefully we'll see each other again in the finals week. So there you go. I just shared that in the uh, Discord channel again. Uh, so check that out if you still need to do that. Um, and, and really, you know, wait until your project's done before you do that. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, I gotta go, but I will see you all later. Thanks for watching, everyone. Hope you're all doing well, and uh, good luck finishing your projects if you're still working on them. If you have any, if there's anything I can help you with, uh, if you're running into problems or issues with it, let me know. I'd be happy to help. Okay, see you later. Bye. Uh,
actually, you know what? I'll switch to. Let's go with this. I'll switch to the bird cam for a minute or two. All right. 